Hello, my name is Veronica Villa. Hello from Ciudad de Mexico. So good afternoon and good evening as well. I want to say hello to everyone who is joining us today at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. We want to thank the organizers for setting up this space for ETC to lead the session on digital agriculture. The title is Precision Farming, Digitalized Nirvana or Corporate Controlled Nightmare. So we welcome you all. Again, my name is Veronica Vija. I am part of the ETC group and I will be the chair for this session. Eight out of every 10 companies earn their profit using digital agriculture platforms. With COVID, big companies sped up their attempts to digitize our food systems. What they're doing is presenting these new corporate configurations, their new corporate associations as a very precise package that will provide advice that will be a, of great service to agriculture and of course to farmers. However, what we've seen with our research from ETC and other organizations as well, is that they are trying to make all of the information from agriculture. They want to take all this data and turn it into just another good, something that they can control, turn it into merchandise. They have information on how it's produced, of how it's processed, information on consumers, on the foods. So with this session, we just want to question what the automation of agricultural production means, what artificial intelligence is and what it means, and what its impact could be on nature and on farmers or on the workers of the food chain. So from farmers to food processors, we can see that there is a certain colonialist attitude and some productive sectors have been um, dominated by this. So this, these new technologies are just repeating the colonialist attitude. That is, they reach specific sections or locations where agriculture is not industrialized and then these companies arrive and they offer or they impose a certain way of doing things. They offer tools, but and then they extract uh, more value, more wealth, and they show this as the only way forward, as the only way in the relationship between people and nature. All of this publicity isn't questioned. The publicity of uh, digitized agriculture is not questioned. It's actually seen as a fourth industrial revolution. The ETC group want to thank the organizers of ORFC for inviting us, for allowing us to share our research and to speak about these issues that concern us. Because we want to build strategies and tools to be able to resist this exploitation, exploitation of people and of nature. Some of you might have heard about the ETC group. We have been around for 40 years, at least. 
and we've been following up on processes that have hurt um, peasant communities, communities that live in remote areas, communities that have a perspective that is not an industrial perspective of agriculture. ETC looked into the impact of industrial biotechnology. We looked into the quality of experts in communities, of experts that were in labs and in the industry. And there was a green revolution, a global green revolution, which tried to show that the future of agriculture would come from the industry and from labs. So the ETC group predicted the advent of, of GMOs because we noticed this union be between seeds and businesses. We saw that this was a new scheme. And ETC said, well, what's going to happen is that these new industries of seeds and chemicals will make seeds dependent on chemicals. So the company itself will sell crops that will not be able to survive without the chemicals. And of course, a few years later, GMOs arrived. So ETC has been following these clues of industrial development in agriculture. Since the year 2000, we had to pay attention to the technological development. Everything became more interlinked. Even in people's minds, everything became more linked. There was a relationship between nature, climate change, the efforts of big companies to solve problems that they had themselves created. So we thought that it was important to make a more generalized criticism of technology in general, technology in life, not just biotechnology. So we looked at technologies in companies, in the industry, in science, to solve climate change, for example. ETC was a pioneer in looking into nanotechnology that is manipulating matter at the molecular level. And looking into the possibility or how that possibility of manipulating molecules, of manipulating the blocks of life, as we said, as we called it before, has manipulated what it means to be alive, what it means to be inert, organic, non-organic. Sometimes ethical barriers are lost. There, we question what is life? What are genes? And what happens with manipulation? when you use it to earn a profit. So ETC criticizes technology in a broad sense. There are questions from non-experts, that is from communities that have been affected. And we promote platforms for social assessment for participation to question these technologies. And this is how we have reached this conference today. 
we want to show the results of one of our research into the behavior of these corporations. We want to look into their greed, their desire to control food systems. And we want to see some perspectives from, from the social um, area. We will look into Latin America as well. And these are basically the efforts that we have been working on as ETC. Now I want to present my colleagues from ETC who will speak further in, in depth about what I have said. First, we have Kavya Chaudhary. She's in Bangalore in India. She's a researcher from ETC. She studied development and environmental governance. She has worked with traditional agriculture. Kavya, you will perhaps describe your work further in depth. She worked in India and Odisha. And she worked all of this in relation to, to food and feeding systems. This is a result of agriculture. And she will speak about a research called Barones de la Alimentación or Food Patterns 2002. Kavya, you have the floor. I think you will share your screen, is that right? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Before you start, Kavya, I just want to check that everyone can, can listen to us. That people who people who can listen to me can actually hear me with the translation. Is that correct? Can somebody from the team let me know that everything is in order? We will continue. Hmm. Yeah, I'll start now. So, Kavya, please begin, and I will, and I will have the questions for the for the chat or from the chat. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. Um, I've I've switched my video so that my internet um, can yeah because my internet is a bit unstable. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Vero, for setting the context and providing the background so well. Um, I'll jump right in to our presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here and giving us the opportunity to share our research and learn from the questions and comments that we'll be looking forward to. I'm Kavya and I work as a researcher with ETC Group and focus on corporate, uh, corporate concentration and digital technologies. Um, recently, we came out with a report on um, corporate concentration in agriculture, which is called Food Barons, as Vero already mentioned. Um, ETC Group has been tracking uh, corporate concentration among other issues, as already uh, mentioned by Veronica, for the last three to four decades. And this kind of historical tracking also helps us in making um, comparisons about how corporate concentration in industrial food and agriculture is moving. So in food balance, we actually tracked increasing corporate concentration using market shares of companies across 11 food and agriculture related sectors. 
Um, and we also track the strategies these uh, big ag firms are deploying to increase their control across the industrial food system. One of the trends among the many that we focused on was the rise of uh, digital technologies that are being introduced by big ag and food companies. Um, big ag and food companies and the increasing involvement of big tech uh, in the industrial food and agriculture chain. And that's what I'll be majorly focusing on um, in this session. Um, many of the ag um, agri-food sectors that we tracked are really heavily concentrated. So the top four companies in the agrochemical sector control 62.3 uh, percent of the market, with Syngenta alone controlling 24.6 percent of the agrochemical sector. And the top six companies in the commercial seed sector control 58 percent of the market, um, with Bayer holding 23 percent. In the agriculture machinery market, you, the top four companies account for 44 percent. And this trend has been going on since the mid-90s. Um, uh, and the consolidation has only gotten worse with fewer, bigger, and more consolidated companies coming up. Uh, 25 years ago, we reported that the top 10 companies in the seed sector control 40% of the market today. Um, and today, it's just two companies. Um, this is a graphic from our report, Food Barons, which you can check out later. Um, in, as I already mentioned, the top six companies um, in the agriculture machinery market account for one half of the market share, but uh, it gets worse when you look at regional concentration. For example, Mahindra and Mahindra controls about 40% of India's farm equipment market. These uh, big supersized uh, corporations are now striking deals with each other focusing on their digital platforms. For example, Deer, Class, uh, CNH Industrial um, formed this data interface project called Data Connect that will enable farmers up operating machinery from these uh, different brands to view and exchange machine data. Uh, and they're also partnering with big tech companies. Um, for example, BASF and Bio, as you can see in the slide, um, Bio uh, uses um, Amazon Web Services to process and analyze all of that data that is collected from farms on the digital platform to promote digital agriculture or precision farming, as the name of the uh, session suggests, and as uh, it's the way the industry calls it. Um, yeah. So on one hand, there is horizontal integration of companies, which is um, how they're growing bigger in size um, by mergers and acquisitions. And at the same time, the another trend that we noticed is the vertical integration of major input firms and tech services happening. So um, where big ag companies are acquiring tech and tech related companies that provide satellite data, um, drone companies, drone software companies, weather prediction companies, input recommendations, and also entering into partnerships or collaborations with them. For example, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, okay. Just let me know if, if, if I'm better now, okay? Uh, or if I need to go slower. Um, so uh, two examples would be, John Deere and Volocopter and Syngenta and DJI. They have, uh, John Deere and Volocopter entered into a partnership um, for a crop spring autonomous agricultural drone. Um, so now instead of selling a seed plus herbicide, they are these seed and pesticide firms, among others, are selling seed plus herbicide plus data-driven input recommendations via the digital platform. So big food and ag companies are introducing multiple new technologies and they're using justifications like the climate crisis, um, that these technologies will help in addressing this, uh, the climate crisis, um, that they'll help in increasing food production, they'll feed a growing population, basically the same reason as they gave for GMC. 
and uh, using all of these reasons to build digital platform. Um, and the interesting part is that most of these big uh, seed, agrochemical, farm machinery, even synthetic fertilizer companies have their own digital platforms from which they use, uh, from which they collect valuable big data on and off farm and are also calling themselves uh, now farms as farm services companies. This quote from um, the brand manager at Syngenta uh, Digital Agriculture Platform says that before we sold pesticides, seeds and fertilizers. Now we are a farm services company. We sell service and technology. Um, so what all does big data include? It means essentially large data sets that can be analyzed uh, using softwares to reveal patterns of behavior, trends, and so on. And this, this data can include genomic data, historical or real-time weather information, crop yields, uh, seeds planted, input prices, how much fertilizer you're applying, how, what are the nutrient levels in your soil? What's the moisture level? And all of this data is collected, stored, and analyzed with the help of algorithms to make automated on-farm decisions to tell the farmer exactly how to practice agriculture, how to plant seeds, how to apply agrochemicals, when to use water, and so on. A lot of us um, uh, heard that in 2013, Monsanto acquired a company called the Climate Corporation. And it said that data science could be a $20 billion revenue opportunity beyond its core business of seeds and chemicals. Um, this was acquired by Bayer in 2018, and now it's turned into Climate Fieldview. And Fieldview now collects or extracts 87.5 billion data points from 180 million acres of farmland in 23 countries and funnels it into the cloud service of Microsoft and Amazon. So just the way, yeah. No oh, oh, no worries. Uh, it, uh, yeah, just let me know because I'm not che uh, checking the chat. Um, okay. 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 Um, yeah. So the way Monsanto said that data science will add to its revenue, that's how the push to digital technology will help in creation of an additional revenue stream to extract valuable data. Um, this is a snapshot from our uh, uh, report, and it only shows the collaborations and the digital platforms of Syngenta and Bayer. So as I already said that most big companies have their own digital platforms and they're already collaborating with each other. Um, these collaborations involve the sale or exchange of data which are analyzed to deliver prescriptions or which are dictated to the farmer on how to farm their land. While it sounds as if this model of agriculture might help farmers, the data that is being extracted from them is extremely valuable and it is unclear who it is being shared with and sold to and what it is being used for and to what end. In fact, we are not even sure if these, uh, if what these digital platforms um, that are saying that, uh, that, that are telling the farmers that they are giving precise recommendations are even as precise because they only focus on a few commercial crops. They can have inaccurate GPS systems um, there, uh, or inaccurate sensors and hardware and software components, especially algorithms. And the inability um, or the ability of these technologies to gauge, to understand uh, complex farm reality um, practices and like microclimates can be seriously questioned. These technologies, actually give corporate business, uh, agribusinesses a better aggregated field view of the entire farming system and lets them issue prescriptions that suit their business interest. So the company that controls farm data will use its own platform to promote its own preferred products uh, or those of its partners. So this attacks farmer autonomy and decision making by creating technology lock-ins. Um, and an example from the global south 
is the leading provider of chatbot, chatbot advisory services to small farmers in Kenya, Arifu, which is partnered with Syngenta. And the job of Arifu is to essentially create a demand for Syngenta seeds. And it's now part of a larger um, digital platform in Kenya, which is called DigiFarm and is operated by the mobile network operator Safari Farm, in turn owned by um, UK company Vodafone. The farmers on the platform have to buy the inputs that are promoted, follow the advice or the dictation of the app to qualify for crop insurance, which they pay for, sell their crops to the company at a fixed price, and receive payments on a digital money app. The, the, digital, the, the legal ownership of data collected on farm by big ag, seed, and farm machinery companies is murky. Um, answers to questions around who is it being sold to, how do these collaborations work on digital platforms, and what it is being used for are unclear. So these are the digital agriculture platforms and their collaborations uh, of some farm equipment man manufacturers uh, like Deer, Agco, and Kubota. Um, Deer, for example, has argued that when a farmer buys one of the company's tractors, they receive a license to operate the vehicle, but they're not the owner of the equipment or the software embedded in it or the data generated by the equipment. And Deere also says that it's illegal for farmers or independent, independent technicians to fix embedded software or parts of their machine. So by asserting themselves as the ultimate data owner, these uh, farm equipment manufacturers seek to retain control of a product that has gained enormous value. And the right to repair movements across the world have fought to thin nail against such manufacturers that want to prevent farmers from fixing the products they've bought. Another trend that we can see is that land is being turned into an investable asset through digitalization. By digitizing so much information on soil fertility, moisture, land records, the, the entry of land into global financial markets is also being facilitated. And people sitting far off can see where the profitable lands are. Now, we have to keep in mind that all of this is happening in the context of the climate crisis scenario. Companies say that agriculture will help sequester or absorb carbon in the soil. And there was a session on uh, carbon farming only yesterday at ORFC. Um, and companies say that farmers can be paid for sequestering carbon in the soil. Bayer has its own carbon program, as you can see on the screen, um, under which it pays farmers for adopting practices that supposedly sequester soil. Of course, the terms for participation in this carbon program were a requirement to plant corn or soybeans, have an active field view plus digital ag account, and agree to share a lot of farm data. So if a farmer wants to be paid for supposedly sequestered carbon, they have to do all of these things dictated by buyer. Another trend that we noticed um, as I already mentioned earlier, was the increasing role of actors that should have nothing to do with agriculture, like big tech. Um, so you have companies like Amazon, Microsoft that are increasingly um, getting involved in agriculture. Microsoft, by the way, is particularly targeting smallholder farmers and has an aim to promote its platform, Farm Beat to small farmers in the global south in the coming years. And it has already signed MOUs with the government of Indonesia and India. The other way, the main way in which these uh, companies are getting into agriculture is via their cloud services. Now, all of that data that is collected on seeds, soil, weather, sale, your, all of these practices will need to be stored, collected, and analyzed somewhere. And this is where big tech comes in in a big way. Um, companies like Amazon Web Services, also called AWS, Microsoft, and others sell their cloud services to these big ag companies and startups so that all of this data can be collected, stored, and processed. 
Most of our digital activity requires cloud services, and this market is high, uh, tightly controlled. Um, the biggest two companies, Microsoft and Google, controlled 60% of the cloud services market in 2020. Amazon alone controls 40%. I know um, most of us associate Amazon with e-commerce um, or, or buying things online, but the most profitable segment of Amazon is actually its AWS, its cloud services. Um, and 76% of the 24.8 billion operating profit of Amazon comes from AWS. Um, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon also own or lease more than half of the undersea bandwidth, which is the undersea cables that carry internet across the sea. Um, Digitalizing agri-food systems is also highly energy and resource intensive, which is something that is not talked about often enough. Um, actually, data should be considered in itself a highly energy and resource intensive input in input agriculture. For example, and this is an old article, um, it has been estimated that by 2025, um, data will use up one fifth of global electricity use. And this calculation was in 2017, before data use increased through the pandemic. And agriculture and food data may be a big part of this. And besides the electricity consumption, it is also the water that is consumed by the cloud services, the data centers for cooling the rows and rows of servers and computers that increases the resource intensive nature of digitization. A newspaper reported that Google's water use in the Dells in Oregon, USA has nearly tripled in the past five years and the company's data centers now consume more than a quarter of all the water used in the city. Google said that all of its global data centers consumed approximately 4.3 billion gallons or 16.3 billion liters of water in 2021. Another way in which um, digital technologies enable extraction is via the mining of cobalt, which is a mineral which is used in many electronic devices and is linked to child labor, exploitation, worker injury and death and pollution of water, river, like, and air. Um, water is also used in the manufacturing of semiconductors. Um, and that's another way in which digitization itself is resource intensive. So when Taiwan, which is home to the TSMC or the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the world's largest contract manufacturer of semiconductor chips. And when it faced drought in 2021, the government prioritized diverting water to chip making industries, halting irrigation over 183,000 acres of farmland. Technology is not neutral, and most of these technologies adopt top-down approaches, are introduced without active participation of small-scale food producers and peasants, and are rarely designed to address the needs of smallholders, but are mostly designed to catch farmers in profit-making schemes and to render them as sources of data and behavior patterns, which can be mined for machine learning to make decisions without farmers, de-skilling them and leading to their dependence on corporations. Governments are collaborating with or facilitating the promotion of ag digitization by big ag and tech in the South, claiming that it will benefit the poor, help address the climate crisis without as much as stating the resource requirements of digital technology. These technologies may also be making the climate crisis worse with their, with their extraction of mineral resources, the consumption of so much energy, and the production of toxic waste. And in most cases, digitization is being introduced without adequate safeguards on data protection, assessment of impacts on the environment, and protection of human rights, and it's eliminating mosaic farming and fruit pra uh, practices and erasing state obligations to provide social obligations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kavya. In your conclusions, well, in, in the slide, we didn't see any text. I don't know if we missed a slide with the final 
conclusions? Kavya, I was I, I was just wondering if there was a slide missing with the conclusions. No, I and if not, could you repeat the conclusion? Could you please repeat them slowly so that we can have the the whole vision, your conclusion, which is very interesting. I'll repeat myself. Um, technology is not neutral. And most of these technologies adopt top-down approaches. They are uh, introduced without active participation of small-scale food producers and peasants, and are rarely designed to address the needs of smallholders, but are mostly designed to catch farmers in profit-making schemes and to render them as sources of data and behavior patterns, which can be mined for machine learning to make decisions without farmers, de-skilling farmers, and leading to their dependence on corporations. Governments are collaborating on, uh, with or facilitating the promotion of ag digitalization by big ag and tech in the South, claiming that it will benefit farmers and will help address the climate crisis without even stating the resource requirements, as I mentioned before, of these digital technologies. These technologies might also be making the climate crisis worse with their um, extraction of mineral resources, the consumption of a lot of energy, and the production of toxic waste. In most cases, digitization is being introduced without adequate safeguards on data protection, assessment of impacts on the environment and prote protection of human rights, and they are eliminating mosaic farming and food practices and erasing state obligations to provide social um, security. Thank you, Kavya. Thank you. We have a question or rather a comment. Maybe we should listen to the next speaker and that way we can put together all the questions. Thank you for writing these questions in the chat. And we will put them in a space for comments and questions. So I will now hand the floor to our ETC colleague, Tom Wakeford. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, I'm Tom Wakeford from etc. I apologize on behalf of our colleague, uh, Barbara and Tembawechi, who's uh, had to pull out at short notice uh, for health, family health reasons. Uh, but I'll just say a bit about Barbara, who's uh, uh, a staff member here at etc. Uh, Barbara is a lawyer and advocate of the High Courts of Uganda and also lecturer in intellectual property rights law based in Uganda. She's got over 10 years experience of research and policy analysis on the food system issues and emerging technologies around GMO crops, synthetic biology and digital agriculture. And at the moment, she's coordinating the Africa Working Group on Digitalization. And this group forms part of the African Digital Technology Assessment Platform. So I'm just going to present her very brief overview of some of the ways in which the global trends that Kavya uh, has just described are playing out in Africa. And then between us, between myself, uh, Kavya and Veronica, we'll, we'll try and answer some questions and, and hopefully have some discussion. So the rapid adoption of mobile phones and the rise of big data underpins a new wave of digital applications in food markets all over the world and africa is no exception to this from robotic tractors and drones spraying 
to fully integrated data-driven strategies to manage food value chains, a host of new digital technologies are now being sold to Africans as a solution to tackling a growing, tackling a growing population, to climate change and to the depletion of natural resources. Using catchy titles like smart farming, precision agriculture, they're working arduously to convince farmers and policymakers and the public that digitalization is the key to sustainable farming systems of the future. For example, aerial images from satellites or from drones, weather forecasts, soil sensors, that sensors in the soil, are all envisaged as managing the growth of crops in real time. So these automated systems are meant to provide early warnings if there are deviations from what is seen as normal growth. Startup companies in countries like Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa have integrated precision farming measures. I'll stop doing these quotes now, but all these are marketing terms which analyze soil data like temperature, nutrients, vegetative health, to help farmers apply the supposedly right amount of fertilizer and to irrigate farms optimally. Just give a, a couple of examples to, to illustrate. Uh, the first is from Kenya and an organization, uh, a company, a startup company called Ujuzi Kilimo. And that is using big data and the analytic capabilities that gives them to supposedly, according to their marketing, transform farmers into a knowledge-based community, as if they weren't already, uh, with the goal of improving productivity through precision insights. Large corporations are advancing digitalization of African agriculture by also linking it to payment systems, to credit platforms and digital insurance. This is targeted at subsistence farmers who, uh, in each case, are competing against local startups uh, on the cost of service in a highly fragmented business with no easy path to scaling up due to barriers such as non-literacy of many farmers, even though they may be brilliant farmers, they may not be literate, particularly in English and uh, yeah, of, of language, of access to, to the language of these tech companies' products. So beyond precision farming itself, financial solutions designed for farmers, for farmers are blossoming. So to just give another example from Kenya, a company called Farm Drive is a startup that connects smallholder farmers with bank accounts, uh, sorry, importantly, connects smallholder farmers without bank accounts to credit while helping financial institutions cost cost effectively increase their loan portfolios. So basically, they are drawing farmers into the system of banking who haven't been in there before and tying them into contracts. Um, and that ultimately is linked to large corporate players. This is a terrible phenomenon for local smallholder farmers in Africa. Most of these technologies are being promoted to farmers who have limited understanding of how these technologies actually work and uh, in the sense that the implications for them are not clear when they sign up to these contracts. We're witnessing the rapid emergence of mobile apps in Africa being offered to farmers by pesticide firms, claiming that these apps will assist them to make decisions on what to plant, on how much to spray and what to harvest. This high-tech approach does not address the real chain challenges, does not address the real challenges facing smallholder farmers who are the backbone of many communities across Africa. Digital corporations use the data they collect from farmers to develop new automated systems. And these are already present in other parts of the world, but they foresee in Africa things like driverless tractors, so tractors that don't need people to drive them, and drones that spray pesticides. But these have these don't have the needs of smallholder farmers in mind, and they are a threat to smallholder livelihoods. 
just to give you an idea of the scale of the growth of the internet in Africa, uh, a recent report said that in 2018, there were 33 million registered internet users in Africa. In the next few years, they predict this will rise to 200 million registered users. And at present, around 13%, one three, 13% of smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa have internet access. Mobile payment apps uh, on smartphones like M-Pesa and EcoCash allow, in theory at least, for all those without bank accounts to be able to undertake transactions digitally. So you see the, the scale uh, that you see the market that's available for these firms potentially and why we, we really need this discussion uh, to happen now before uh, uh, these things go, go any further. Online marketplaces uh, examples are Kula and Yebo Fresh in South Africa and direct wholesalers like iFarm in Kenya and direct farm consumer services like Fresh in a Box in Zimbabwe are enabling some farm farmers to bypass wholesalers and physical retail so stores and sell direct to the consumer. So just in conclusion, we feel it's important that African civil society's movements and movements start to develop a critical voice on the governance of digitalization in agriculture within the framework of food sovereignty. Smallholder farmers in particular must be part of a resistance to the onslaught of multinational companies digitally pushing farmers into industrialized agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for this perspective on digitalization. This research is also being carried out by our colleague, Barbara. And this is part of the platform for the social assessment of technologies in Africa. We've called this AFRITAP. So to conclude this view, this point of view, I want to share two ideas. One has to do with the situation in Latin America, and the other has to do with the need to obtain more digital information. To meet the right to food. This discussion is being held on in the within the committee for food safety uh, worldwide. And organizations are questioning this vision of the need for more digital information just to meet this need. So any questions in the chat before I talk about Latin America? Any more comments? So as uh, so we get to the last few minutes, and we can, uh, towards the end, we can answer questions. Finally, on behalf of the ETC group, in Latin America, there are 17 million or more uh, agricultural units that are not industrial. There's a peasants, small scale farmers, family farmers, or agroecological farming, non industrial farming. So there's a high level of interest among these digital agricultural uh, platforms like FarmBeats from Microsoft. They've been clear about this. They want to reach those 17 million non-industrial farms in Latin America. In America, in Latin America. Land tenure is still social for us. 
collective ownership of lands. This comes from old uh, original civilizations, indigenous cultures that still remain in the region. Modern governments have not been able to end this collective ownership of land. So there's a lot of interest in making decisions by farmers more individual. So studies have shown one of the objectives of digitalization of agriculture in Latin America is breaking with the collective nature of decisions on what is produced, how it's produced, what is the relationship between the communities and the natural resources. Clearly, this is important. So prov providing tools that are only useful for individuals, for in uh, entrepreneurs, in inverted commas, the business person who will use these new tools for production. So that's where digitalization is going in Latin America. That's the aim. Furthermore, they're trying to break up the collective nature of decision-making and social ownership of land. There are strong interests in using public infrastructure, for example, antennas, TV stations set up by governments decades ago. That's where these digital platforms want to reach to deal with the problem of connectivity. Many issues from Africa are also found in Latin America. For example, provision of financial services to everyone who doesn't have a fixed income. Most of the economy in Latin America is informal. Far more, well over 60% in most countries in Latin America. These are people who don't have banking services, who don't have credits, don't have a credit card. Also, a lot of income comes from migrants. Handling all this money is something that's very interesting for these telecoms companies. This is all combined with extraction of more minerals that are needed for digital devices, be it phones, tablets, antennas, cables. So this is exacerbating extraction, for example, of lithium. People are talking about lithium wars in Latin America. Tesla is going to invest a lot in Mexico with a view to gaining access to minerals, especially lithium across Latin America with uh, a strategic foothold in Mexico. To end, I'd like to say this, digitalization in Latin America is happening where Agriculture is already industrialized in areas where um, transgenics or GMOs were introduced, first of all, in the uh, southern cone of Latin America. These areas have been devastated by agrotoxics that go hand in hand with transgenics. There are many people who have become very ill thanks to the use of agrotoxics. They're not producing food for people, they're producing commodities. There's, uh, Mexico is the case I know best. Digital agriculture wants to produce agave for mezcal and tequila. Av avocados for export, all types of berries, which command a good price in the market outside Mexico. But this will not feed the people most of the food, as the ETC group and other groups have said over decades, in fact, comes from small-scale farming 
non-industrial farming, which is diverse and rich. And these, um, this is not what we're going to get from digital, digitalized agriculture. Let me just have a quick look at the chats and the comments. One minute. I'll just look through the comments and questions in the chat. Veronica, I think we have uh, Caviar already um, able to answer the, the question that came up about um, uh, farmers getting adequate rewards and things like that. Is, is that right, Caviar? Um, I'll repeat the question. Great. Yeah. Um, the question says, how can you plan to small uh, how can you plan um, to small farmers access this data? Remember, in Africa, for example, more than 90% of small farmers cannot access devices. The rural areas um, have lack of electricity and network and most farmers are illiterate. What is really the plan to involve the, uh, most of the farmers in developing countries? Um, I think uh, as Barbara's and Tom's presentation highlighted that most of these high-tech digital technologies are very disconnected from small farmers, um, uh, uh, their worldview and their practices. And instead of asking how we can fit the small farmer into this big tech uh, imposed technology that is that that is being fueled by finance and big ag and big tech, we should ask, uh, are these technologies of any use to small farmers at all? Um, are driverless tractors, drones of any use? Is in uh, in this day when we are faced with climate crisis, increasing food insecurity, is, is digital technology the solution? Um, you know, um, instead of uh, imposing it on farmers, uh, the way it's being done. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my response. So I was going to tackle, a, I think, a, a question that related to that um, about the rewards farmers got in providing data and that somebody wrote, uh, basically, farmers are consumers of digital technology, not creators of it. And I know what I want to know what approach could be a good solution to, to tackle data dominance by tech giants so it's it's a really interesting question i guess what i feel is important to convey from the etc side which hopefully came across in caviar veronica and my presentation is that actually in the view of the tech giants and in their business model farmers are creators of digital technology because they have the uh information on their farms, which is uh, valuable to the data giants. And the comparison we use is if you think of social media like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, all these ones where they are, um, the data giants are harvesting all your social connections and then they're using them in the case of elections that include elections in Africa, Europe, North America, they are then used um, by politicians to take power in elections and things like that. They're basically manipulating the data you sent in to try and um, uh, change people's voting preferences. So in the analogy uh, to what is called social caching, so the caching of data of your social context in the terms of farming, you could call it ecological caching. They want to take all the information of where, if you have a tractor, where it's gone, what you're planting where, um, the weather on your farm, the soil conditions, that is something that in their eyes is um, uh, a good way of making profit and their claim is they will help the farmer. And I think our analysis is that that's 
uh, largely for their benefit, and it is very hard to see what the benefit to the the farmer would be. So um, that's that's the the challenge of of that one. I see we're very close to the end on time, so I'll hand it back to Veronica. Thanks, Tob, Kavya. Thanks to the interpreters and the organisers. The organisers of the entire uh, conference. I'd just like to invite you to write to the ECTC group. Tom, could you put our email addresses into the chat, please? The, this research is ongoing. It's uh, not closed. This issue develops every day. One big issue is how digitalization is being used to put farming land onto carbon markets. We haven't been talking about that today. And that's a big issue. It's a big uh, illusion from these big companies. The production of food is not the same thing as digital agriculture, or digital farming. So we do need to face, they say these new techniques will uh, help with the climate crisis, but we've seen the increase in, we've heard about the increase in mineral extraction and use of inputs. This is for the benefit of certain industrial sectors. Thank you so much. I think that's the end of the session. You're just running one minute over. It's a big conference. So please do come to the other sessions and look at our documents on the ETC website. Thank you.